Hi, this is Andrea again, and I am back with you for HIT 210. This is Chapter 12, Part 4. Hopefully, we'll get through the rest of our slides on this one, but we may need another round. We'll see. So let's go on to some more coding guidelines. Let's focus on diabetes because you'll probably have a fair number of diabetes, diabetic patients that you'll see in the office since they require follow-up on a, on a regular basis, um, even if it's just, just checking blood sugar or maybe it's just checking how they're doing with their insulin dose. Does that need to be changed? Um, those types of things. And, and having a, a serious chronic lifelong disease such as diabetes these patients will probably be back several times. So the five categories of diabetes are diabetes due to an underlying condition, drug or chemical induced diabetes, type one diabetes, type two diabetes, or other specified diabetes. So if you run across inadequately controlled, out of control and poorly controlled, those types of diabetes they all code out to the type of diabetes with hyperglycemia. So if you have a patient come in and you, ta you take their, um, their blood sugar, it's running high, the doctor evaluates them and documents out of poorly controlled di diabetes. Um, hopefully they give you the type, like type two or type one, and just say poorly controlled. When you go to code that out, that poorly controlled translates into whatever type of diabetes they have, type 1, type 2, or however else they specify it, with hyperglycemia. So um, mentally, if it's not under control or well controlled, you're going to you're gonna code it out to that type of diabetes with hyperglycemia. And that's just a terminology thing to know and be aware of. So let's talk about our earaches and our ear infections because those are common too. And we and that was one of those that we looked up in one of our prior videos. There are now separate otitis media codes for superative, non-superative versus unspecified. So again, if it is um if it's if it's not specified and you can't get your provider to clarify it, you code it to the unspecified. If it is superative and they document superative, that's what you code it to. If it's non-superative and that's what they document it, you code it to that. So when you code it and you're coding um, otitis media and any respiratory system disorder, if an underlying cause is indicated, it must be coded. Because what they're trying to do is understand how many of these are being caused by exposure to tobacco, whether that is someone's personal use down in Z72.0, whether it's tobacco dependence, which is F17, and then um, the additional codes based on the tabular. Is it an occupational exposure to tobacco smoke, Z57.31? Is it a history of tobacco use? Maybe they um, use tobacco and they stopped 15 years ago, but do they have that history? That's Z87.891. Are they, ex were, is this a child that was exposed to tobacco smoke in the perinatal period? And that's going to be P96.81 because it's perinatal. Um, are they exposed to environmental tobacco smoke? That's your secondhand smoking. That's, that's the children of parents who smoke. And so they're exposed to that in their home or in the parent's car, those types of things. That's going to be Z77.22. So you'll notice when you look at coding guidelines in the tabular for otitis media and really most respiratory sy system disorders, you're going to be asked to code an underlying cause. So it might be beneficial to train your providers that if it's otitis media or respiratory system type thing, let they need to document the exposure. How is the, did this person have any exposure to tobacco in any possible way, shape, or form, past, present, or future, so to speak? Let's talk about hypertension and asthma. Hypertension codes no longer classify the type. It used to be um, you'd hear about benign hypertension, essential hypertension, malignant hypertension versus unspecified. It's no longer classified. It's hypertension. So whether it's benign, essential, malignant, or unspecified, it all codes to hypertension. Um, 
regardless of what is documented. Hypertension is hypertension. And asthma, on the other hand, has flipped. It used to be just plain asthma. Now they classify the type. Is it mild intermittent? Is it mild persistent, moderate persistent, or severe persistent? So with asthma, if you have a child or an adult come in with asthma, you need your provider to clarify what type of asthma do they have? Is it going to be mild and intermittent? Is it mild persistent? Is it moderate persistent or severe persistent? So just be aware of that, that as you're coming in, you will always know it this way because this is the way you're being trained. But other people who have done it for a long time, they were supposed to have changed over in 2016, but some things hold on forever. And especially if you're talking about providers and their documentation. So you're going to want to encourage them to just be aware. Hypertension is hypertension. Asthma, on the other hand, you've got to have a type. What about um, body mass index, BMI, and pressure ulcers? For body mass index and pressure ulcer stage codes, you can code those based on the medical record documentation from clinicians who are not a physician or physician extender, since this information is typically documented by other clinicians involved in the patient's care, such as nurses, dietitians, wound care specialists, rehab therapists, those types of things. However, the associated diagnosis, such as are they overweight, obese, um, is this due to is this pressure ulcer due to being diabetic? That has to be documented by the patient's provider. So just know that if you're in an office and the BMI is documented by the MA or by an LPN or by a nurse, you can pick that up and code it. But you can't, you cannot code whether or not they're overweight, obese, that type of thing, unless it's documented by the provider. So just make sure you know that difference. And then be aware too that if someone has a pressure ulcer, when you go to code it, when you move from the index to the tabular, you need to make sure that your code reflects the laterality and stage, and it's all in one code. So you don't have a code for pressure ulcer laterality and pressure ulcer stage. It's all in one code. It includes pressure ulcer, the laterality, and the stage. And so again, you kind of need that information. The laterality and the stage, you can probably get from like wound care documentation or, or nursing documentation, that type of thing. But again, um, you want to make sure that at least the pressure ulcer is acknowledged by the provider. So what about some odds and ends here? Well, if you look in H40 category, there are a lot. H40 is eyes. Eyes. So be um, if that's what you were wondering about, that's eyes. And this specifically is glaucoma. And there are many codes in that H40 glaucoma category that are going to require a seventh character to talk about the stage of the glaucoma, whether it's unspecified, mild, moderate, severe, indeterminate. So just FYI, that that small chapter, that small category, H40, when it's talking about glaucoma, you're going to need to, to use sometimes X as a placeholder to get to your seventh digit um, because that seventh digit in H40 is going gonna, is gonna to identify the stage of the glaucoma. So if you happen to end up working in an ophthalmology office um, or for an optometrist, those types of things, that's where you could see that. Um, the category for Alzheimer's disease, G30, now reflects onset. Uh, onset, I'm sorry, onset. Whether, whether it was early onset or late onset. And that is something that's relatively new that, you know, when you're coding Alzheimer's, um, if you have an office patient that has Alzheimer's, it, the provider needs to make it clear whether this was early onset or late onset. And then you're going to use an additional code from the Z16 um, category when an infectious disease is resistant to an antibiotic. So let's say that you have somebody with a urinary tract infection. Um, you find out that they have an E. coli urinary tract infection and it is resistant to penicillin. You're going to use an additional code. You're going to code the UTI 
you're going to code that it was due to the E. coli, and you're going to code that this is resistant to antimicrobial drugs, so you'll have a Z16 code there as your third code. So let me say that again. If you have a patient who has a urinary tract infection that is due to E. coli, which is antibiotic resistant or antimicrobial resistant, then you're going to have three codes. Your first code is going to be that urinary tract infection. Your second code is going to be uh, um, one from the A category that talks about the E. coli infection. And your third code is going to be Z16 something, and it's going to reflect the fact that this is this infectious disease, this E. coli, is resistant to antimicrobial drugs or, or antibiotics or those types of things. So I just wanted to clarify that. Anemia. All right, this is another fun one. When an admission or an encounter is for the management of an anemia that is associated with a malignancy and the treatment is only for the anemia, the code for the malignancy is sequenced first, then followed by the code for the anemia. And odds are it'll be D63.0, anemia in neoplastic disease. So again, just remember, if you're in an office, you're coding that a patient's coming in because they have anemia and it's due to their cancer, the cancer code goes first, then the anemia code goes. And this is just one strange twist with ICD-10. I can't really explain it. It just is the way that they made the guideline. Okay, when the admission or encounter is for the management of an anemia, that is associated with an adverse effect of chemotherapy, immunotherapy, those types of things, and the only treatment is for the anemia, then you can code the anemia first, followed by the neoplasm code and the adverse effect code, which is going to be your T45.1X5, adverse effect of anti-neoplastic and immunosuppressive drugs. So that one is totally flipped from the first one. If it is for the management of an anemia that's an adverse effect and the only treatment being done is for the anemia. That's when the anemia gets coded first. Hopefully you won't work for an oncology office and have to know this. But if you do, there you go. Um, when the admission encounter is for the management of an anemia associated with radiation therapy, the anemia code is first, followed by the neoplasm code, code followed by Y82.84, sorry, let me back up, followed by Y84.2 for radiological procedure and radiotherapy as cause for the abnormal reaction of the patient or of the later complication without mention of misadventure at the time of the procedure. Big mouthful. Basically, the last two boxes on this screen are the same. If somebody's coming in for an encounter that is managing anemia that comes from either chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or radiation therapy, then you're going to code that anemia first. And then you'll code the cancer. And then you'll code the adverse effect code, which is going to be T45 for um, chemo or immunotherapy, or Y84.2 for um, the uh, radiation therapy. All right, it's almost 14 minutes here. I'm going to try and push through because I think we are getting really close to the end. So hang on with me. Don't give up. Um, this is just miscellaneous, three miscellaneous things I thought you needed to be aware of. If there is an external cause of morbidity, meaning death, if someone dies and you need to explain why they die, you're going to be using a code from the V through Y chapters in ICD-10, and it will require the use of a seventh character, so you may have to use X as a placeholder for anything that you don't have prior to that seventh character. Um, I'll have to give you some examples that we'll walk through that make more sense, but just remember, if you're in the V's or the Y's, or the V, W, X and Y, those four chapters, V, W, X, Y. 
you may be required to use a seventh character. And if that's the case, just be aware you might have to use X as a placeholder. If you use, excuse me, Y92 in conjunction with Y93, then the place of occurrence should only be coded on the initial encounter for treatment. So what this is saying is the first time the patient seeks treatment and you've had to code the place of occurrence and the activity, you only have to code that that first time. <coughs> Excuse me, just a second. All right, hopefully my unsweet iced tea there will help. So let me say that again. If you are coding, maybe someone has an injury, a sprain, a strain, that type of thing, and it's the first time they're seeking care, their initial encounter for treatment, and you have to code the place and the activity, you will do that. But when they come in a second time for a checkup on it, you'll only code the activity. You won't code the place again. Hopefully that makes sense. And then the last one, there is a separate category for nicotine dependence with subcategories for the specific tobacco product and nicotine-induced disorders. So just be aware that in IC10CM, there's a huge long section on nicotine dependence. And you have to really get into the tabular to see the subcategories for the specific product and, and whether or not there's um, nicotine-induced in, disorders. So just be aware if you have to code anything related to nicotine dependence, um, you're going to want to get into that tabular and just be aware there's going to be a lot of choices there because they're really trying to narrow it down to collect data. Oh, sepsis. I didn't realize we still had sepsis left. But sepsis is fairly easy in the sense that for the most part, you won't run across septic patients unless you're in the hospital. You may have a patient come into the office and be diagnosed as being septic and sent to the hospital, but that will probably be your only interaction with sepsis. For a diagnosis of sepsis, the underlying systemic infection or causal agent should determine the code. If it's not specified or known, then you're going to put in A41.9 just for sepsis unspecified organism. But for the most part, they're going to probably figure out what type of sepsis it is, particularly in the hospital. But in the office, you may find yourself doing A41.9 for sepsis unspecified organism if you've got someone who comes in with sepsis and is going to be sent to the hospital. The, if you have somebody who comes in who is severely septic, which I can't imagine, um, but it could happen on a very, 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 very rare basis, you are going to use two codes. One will be for the sepsis itself, and that'll be an A code. And then you also have to use R65.2 severe sepsis. And then if there's any associated organ dysfunction or failure, that would be a third code that you would assign. Now, you should not have patients who come into the office in septic shock. That should be ambulance trip to the ED automatically. Um, that should just not happen because septic shock means that you've got acute organ failure. Their respiratory system is failing. Um, maybe their kidney system is failing. These are critically ill patients. These are the kinds that are air flighted places or end up in ICU um, on a vent pretty quickly. So septic shock, it, it is severe sepsis with organ failure. And when you code it, again, you use an A code for the sepsis and then R65.21 to reflect the septic shock. Um, unless it's post-procedural and then you use the T code. But the code for the septic shock should never be the principal or first diagnosis on the account. And same thing for severe sepsis. You never use R65.2 or R65.21 as the principal diagnosis. It's always going to be a secondary diagnosis. Your sepsis code itself, the A, A whatever it's going to be, that's going to be your, your principal or your first diagnosis no matter what as long as you have sepsis of some sort. So I'm not going to linger on that. And guess what? We are done.
that is it. So it's right at 20 minutes. I'm going to hop off now. This will be part four, and then I'll be back with some more information, all right? So hang tight.